Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. A very warm welcome to Meet Menaka, episode 49, Water Works After 50 with Dr. Tarani Vikunan today. Our website and the email you are receiving has changed. It is now, it is meet at menaka.co. So please bear with us and please have, keep a note because otherwise it might go into your junk uh, mail and you might not um, receive our emails. And as you know, since July, we have started the show on Sundays at 2 p.m. UK time and 6.30 p.m. India Sri Lanka time. Today, we have another eminent guest speaker, Dr. Tarnit Mikuran, who has an MBBS, MRCS, and also a PhD and FRCS in urology. It's a privilege to have her as a speaker. Tarani has been a urology consultant at Epsom and St. Helier University Hospital NHS Trust since 2013. She became the clinical lead for the urology department in 2020. Her subspeciality interests are female urology and pediatric urology. She has recently introduced laser prostate procedures to the trust as well. So her medical training was at Guy's and St. Thomas and her urology training was within the London Deanery. She was awarded her PhD in prostate cancer molecular biology at University College London. She's a keen educator, was foundation training program director. She has been a member of the specialty advisor committee for urology since 2019. So she is a true expert in the area and it's such a privilege to have you Tarani on the platform. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I very much feel that I'm being interviewed by the Oprah Winfrey of our <laughs> So uh, thank you very much um, for inviting me and Dr. Kanta as well for introducing us. Thank you so much, Tarni. As we age, it's no secret that we have different health challenges. One such thing is urinary incontinence, but I, you know, you're the expert. Um, you might know other things which people are reluctant to address or talk about. So can we first have a, um, a bit of know-how? What are the common difficulties in the waterworks after 50? So absolutely, urinary incontinence is very common, uh, common in both men and women but uh, I can see more girls on the screen, so I'm going to talk about the women first, if I may. Uh, so women absolutely can have incontinence and it increases as one gets older. The two main types of incontinence is stress incontinence and urge incontinence. And stress incontinence is when women, or men actually, cough, or sneeze, or exert themselves, or move, um, exercise, that's when a little bit of involuntary leakage of urine may occur. And that might be a little or a lot, but that is the definition of stress urinary incontinence. Urge incontinence is that feeling of, ooh, I need to go for a wee, and I need to go now, and not getting there on time. So the other things that might also occur with urgency and urging continence is going more often. So frequency, going every hour, every two hours, and also getting up at night. So maybe once, twice, three times, and for some even more bothersome than that. So in essence, there's two different types of leakage of urine, stress and urge incontinence. And both of these can also occur together. And that's wow. for women and for men. Um, I guess the next bit is how does one manage that? Um, and I guess even before that is do patients happily come to the GP and the doctor with that? I think we all know it is less talked about and people are reluctant to seek advice for these things. So 
can you tell us like exactly to the point what you said do they happily come to see the doctors about it and what stops them from doing it and once they do come to the doctor how can they actually manage it i guess um if they've come to me in a hospital setting it means that they've been brave enough to talk about it with their gp and the gp has then referred them on to me if we look at um i know we've got people from all over the world but nhs in the national health service in the uk every patient that gets referred from the gp for a non cancer condition is on an 18 week pathway and that means that by from the point that the gp refers to us in the hospital we then the, the sort of clock starts and we then have to manage and treat the patient by 18 weeks. So that actually is great for the patient. It gives them a time frame of, I'm going to get seen, diagnosed and treated within a timely way. I think the first barrier as we've already started discussing is being brave enough to talk about it. And what one needs to understand is that it is common and you should absolutely present to the GP because there's very much, uh, there's things that we can do to help. So uh, do you think, Tari, like the earlier they come, the prognosis is better, it can be managed better? Um, definitely in the sense of if you live with a condition for a long time, it's that feeling of, can I do anything about it? The emotional mental health burden of that and that quality of life can reduce. So to try and get to solutions in a timely way um, would absolutely help with that final management process. Sure, thank you. I'm sure we'll be touching this uh, throughout the show, I guess, but are there any causes which are often not discussed for urinary incontinence? There, do you think, I mean, you are the expert, so there might be causes which are commonly known and there might be uh, causes which either we don't know or we don't want to talk about. So for stress incontinence in women, it is usually good old childbirth and pregnancy. Um, more weight on the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor is the muscles that sort of the hammock of muscles that support the pelvic organs. So more pressure on that pelvic floor. So that could be the commonest thing is fat, I'm afraid to say. So high BMI raised um, increased weight. And unfortunately for um, Asian population, it's a central obesity. So it's the, it's the lovely Vandi that we all, um, that we need to um, somehow manage um, because what that's doing is putting pressure on our pelvic floors. And therefore every cough, sneeze is just a little bit more weight um, onto that pelvic floor causing incontinence. Um, so for stress incontinence, it's weight, childbirth, pregnancies, constipation so not being able to you know what what else can sit there and cause pressure is stool so ensuring that the bowels are opening well is also key and i know i've talked a lot about women but i mustn't forget the men and i guess men with stress incontinence is usually after surgery that they have stress incontinence and that is men who've had uh, treatment for prostate cancer potentially, um, and that can be a cause for why they leak after surgery. So we mustn't forget the men in the story that men too can get stress incontinence. So, but it's more prevalent in women, as I understand, am I mean, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Sure. And what about you, lower urinary tract symptoms? I think. Do you think it you know, happens in men and women? And what are the incidents? And uh... So absolutely happens in both men and women. So in men, it's, um, we divide it up into uh, sort of storage symptoms, voiding symptoms, and 
uh, post menstruation dribbling. So for men, the storage symptoms that they may describe is again, frequency, coming to, you know, going for a wee regularly, getting up at night, that feeling of urgency. The voiding symptoms that they come with is difficulties passing urine, difficult starting to initiate that void. And then lastly, dribbling. Um, so, you know, as the pants are going on, dribbling a bit into the pants and that also cause, uh, you know, uncomfortableness, embarrassment, etc. So absolutely, there are things that we can do. We know that with age, that the lower uni tract symptoms increase. Um, and I'm seeing something in the chat about drinking two litres of water a day. Perfect. Big thumbs up uh, for that. So absolutely, it's two litres for all the girls and three litres for the boys. So, you know, um, I've got my lovely water bottle with me always. Um, and, and this water bottle is 700 mils. So I know that I've got to drink three of those in a day. So when I'm at work before lunch, I would make sure that I've finished that. And at lunchtime, refill it, drink it, finish it in the afternoon. And then in the early evening, have another bottle. And that's how I know that I've got my two liters in. Because if it's a busy day operating, et cetera, uh, it's, it, it's a difficult one. The next question that was, or a statement that was made in the chat is how often should one pass urine? And I say, you should be weaned like at school. Um, so before school, at lunchtime, after school at 3.30, bedtime at seven o'clock, and you know, we are allowed another wee um, at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, et cetera. But a pro you know, roughly, it's about three to four hours. Why do we say that? If you're drinking good volumes, your bladder should be able to hold 400 to 500 mils before you go for a wee. So that's a normal bladder capacity. And for those people who are going very often, that might be because their bladder has now become smaller. And if the blood has become smaller, um, what then happens is that the bladder hits that point and says, oh, you know, bladder tells the brain, you're full, you're full, go and pee. So you're then, the bladder is then becomes the boss rather than the brain being the boss. So the bladder is telling the brain you're full at a lower volume. So what we need to do for that good bladder health is maintain a good bladder capacity, which is 400 to 500 mils every time we pee. So sometimes we get patients to fill out little bladder diaries. So over three days, we tell them to write how much they're drinking and how much they're peeing. And that will give them a good feel of what they're doing, how much they're drinking, and are they able to hold 400 to 500 mils each time? Thank you, Tani. Like, and I think you have really explained it so well because I think this is something everyone knows it happens, but somehow we you know, shy away from speaking or talking about. So it's thank you so much for that. So I think another important subject is urological cancer. You know. As an expert, what would you think a common person like me needs to know about it, men and women, really? So um, I feel I need to teach a bit of anatomy or, 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 or uh, impart some um, anatomy, if I may. And that is what are the urological organs, if you like. And that's the kidneys, which are like two little kidney beans in the back. And then the two pipes, which are the ureters going from the kidneys going to the bladder and then the water pipe or the urethra out. For men, they have a prostate gland which sits at the base of the bladder surrounding the urethra or the water pipe as well. And cancers can occur in each of those levels. So in the kidney, in the bladder, in the prostate. And then in, in for men, the other sort of urological cancers that we look after is testicular cancer as well. The most common cancer is prostate cancer with more than 40,000 um, prostate cancer cases in the UK. So that risk of prostate cancer in men is one in six. So 
you know, we do have men in this audience, and that's a one in six or one in six incidents of prostate cancer, um, which is high. It is the most common urological cancer in the UK for men, um, for, for urological cancers. The next one is renal cancers, and that risk for men is around one in 30 and one in 60 in women. So for the general, you know, we, we diagnose about 13,000 renal cancers in the UK every year. And then as we go down, it's then bladder cancer, which is 10,000 cases per year. Again, that male and female incidence is different with men having a chance of one in 50 and women one in 130. So how would any of us know whether we have any of these cancers? Um, and I think the, the key here is what we call is red flag symptoms. Um, and that's blood in the urine. Um, the technical word is hematuria. And blood in the urine is one of those things that we say that has to trigger you going to see your GP as soon as possible, because that is a worrying symptom. Of course, you can get it for other benign conditions like a urinary tract infection, but painless blood in the urine is a concerning feature and requires uh, relevant investigations. So blood in the urine is key. Recurrent urinary tract infections would be another thing that would make us uh, go to uh, you know, seek advice and ask people to seek advice. For prostate cancer, there's actually no, for most of the prostate cancer, how we detect prostate cancer, we no longer are detecting it with symptoms at all. Because if they're coming with significant symptoms, and that might be bone pain, that prostate cancer is already spread to the bone. Most of the prostate cancer that we pick up is incidentally um, with maybe patient concern, a family history of prostate cancer, um, and sometimes worsening urinary symptoms that's triggering men to seek advice and a PSA, a prostate specific antigen blood test is done, which if it is raised, then triggers further tests. Thanks, Ali. So listening to you, I guess looks like prostate cancer is quite common. So is there anything men can do to detect it early and seek um, advice or assistance or treatment? So um, there were large screening trials done both uh, in the continent and in America um, more than 10 years ago now. And the bottom line was we do not have a good screening test for prostate cancer. So for example, uh, breast cancer, cervical cancer, women are screened. However, for prostate cancer, the PSA blood test, not a very good screening tool because it may be low, but you still may have prostate cancer. It may be high. And even if you have prostate cancer, it may never affect your life or your, you know, your, your length of life. Um, so, the, the simple answer is if you're concerned and worried, then absolutely go and get ask about prostate cancer. If you're worried and you want your PSA checked, that's fine, but ensure that you're appropriately um, counseled about what that would mean for you. We treat prostate cancer, localized prostate cancer. If you've got a life expectancy, of more than 10 years. So sometimes I ask my patients, how long do you want to live? How long do you think you're going to live for? And say, you know, how long did their parents live for? What other medical issues are there? Because if you've got, um, if you're very unwell, prostate cancer is never going to affect you. And one of the other things we say is you, sort of live, you, you die with it, then from it with regards to prostate cancer. It may never affect your life expectancy. 
But that, that requires a few more investigations before we can get to that statement. Sure, thanks, Arnie. Before we move on, of course, thank you so much. I think prostate cancer is quite common and um, for whatever reason, people are still, um, how to say, reluctant to speak about this and seek uh, assistance. So it's, I think it's important to increase the awareness and you know, it's, it's even for me, I didn't realize how common it is. <laughs> you know, till you told me the statistics. So, you know, I'm sure like many other people might not know either. So I think it's important for men and women to know this so that they can encourage, um, you know, themselves and people who they are with uh, to go and uh, do something about it. I just want to revert back to the UTI and um, incontinence. The, I remember we were having the conversation before and, um, there is a connection between sexual abuse and some of the difficulties. Can you expand on that, please? So, um, so I'm trying to figure out where to start with that conversation. <laughs> um, so women come to me for, with urinary symptoms. And um, sometimes one of the urinary symptoms is difficulties passing urine. And the question is then why are they having difficulties passing urine? And if they are having difficulties passing urine and if they're not emptying their bladder very well, then you get a pool of urine in the bladder. And for girls, our water pipes are only three centimeters long and therefore bacteria can then stay in that pool and cause a urinary tract infection. So one of the questions that I do ask my patients occasionally is about sexual abuse. Um, and why is that? Because we know that sexual abuse can sometimes cause pelvic floor dysfunction. And that is, we want our pelvic floor muscles, which is that hammock of tissue where the water pipe runs through it, um, the vagina and the uterus sitting above it, and the back passage all running through our pelvic floor, what we want is a good pelvic floor tone. But if it is all very, very tight, then one can have difficulties emptying the bladder. So we want good pelvic floor health. We want it to be relaxed most of the time, but when we're about to cough or sneeze, we want to be able to engage our pelvic floors so that we can close off the water pipe, if you like, prevent leakage. In sexual abuse, one of the things we find is a very tense pelvic floor. And when, and that could be from previous traumas, basically, um, that what these women are doing are simply holding that pelvic floor tight. It doesn't mean that only in sexually abused women do you get a tense pelvic floor. Um, you know, just like we sit at a computer sitting, uh, straining our backs and our necks and tensing those muscles, the pelvic floor muscles are part of those core muscles. So even without being aware of it, you could be tensing your back muscles, your neck muscles, and your pelvic floor. So we might find that with neck ache and back ache, but also pelvic floor, super oh, pain uh, in the pelvis, difficulties passing urine, and even further recurrent urinary tract infections. So going back to your question of, of sexual abuse, it's a really difficult one of when you ask that question, you're asking that question because it has an impact on how you're going to manage that. But community-wise, if, if that patient then says, yes, there's a history of sexual abuse, the next question that I ask is, has that been reported? Because is that user still in the position of abusing and you know we we then have to just go down in a very sensitive way 
of discussing these things further. Um, does that vaguely answer? Sure. Sure. Yes, thank you. Because I just wanted to touch upon it because, as you know, particularly in certain communities, sexual abuse is still a stigma a taboo, and we just prefer to brush it under the carpet. And I just want the wider community, I guess, to understand there are health implications long term as well. It's so much more important to speak about these things. So thank you, Tari, for that. So I think we kind of focused in Waterworks over 50 as uh, we were supposed to. But even though the challenges that we discuss are common after a certain age, there are difficulties the young ones uh, have as well. For example, bedwetting in children. What are your thoughts about it? Absolutely, and bedwetting is very common. So, um, you know, the, the statistic roughly is 10% of five-year-olds and 5% 5 of 10-year-olds are still wet in the bed. So it's not something that they need to get beaten up about. That is not their fault. It is, again, a function of the bladder. If you think about how babies pass urine, it's simply an involuntary action, a bladder spasm, a little squeeze that's causing the bladder to empty. But if those bladder spasms continue, that's when you get that the bladder squeezes, you're suddenly feeling, oh, I need to go for a wee right now. And that's urgency. So we know that as babies grow, those bladder spasms reduce. So with time, it should absolutely get better. But how do we then teach children to manage their bedwetting? And I guess as mothers, we might see our children doing a little bit of a dance. <laughs> Off you go, off you go, you need, to, you need to go to the toilet. But actually, yes, that dance might be a bladder spasm, but it's a spasm. It comes and it goes away. So what the children start to learn to do is they may sit in a funny way or cross their legs, do a little dance, and the spasm goes away and then they can continue to train their bladder to hold a normal bladder capacity for their age. So as parents, we need to zip it and say, keep drinking your water. Because yes, even in children, they have fluid requirements. So if we think about, a, you know, a, a four year old should be drinking one liter of water a day and a 10-year-old should be drinking 1.5 litres, one, between 1.2 to 1.5 litres of water a day. So actually, even children need to be good with their water drinking. And they are then learning to manage these bladder spasms. Because if this bladder spasm happens at night, they could then wet the bed. But if the bladder then gets used to managing that bladder spasm, building up that bladder capacity, they grow out of the bedwetting sooner rather than later. So bedwetting is, um, it can be quite distressing, not just for the child, but for the parents managing that at home because it's lots of sheets to wash, et cetera. And one of the things I do is talk about how to manage even 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 sort of simple things that you can do like bed wetting alarms sheets under the bed sheets that sort of thing to manage bed wetting would you elaborate on it i'm sure you know like it will be useful for many people at least a few points yeah so so the the things that we talk about um so i say to the children it's very simple in children's language it's drink we poo so drink however much i say depending on your age we, and I talk about what their bladder capacity should be. So the, for the fast mathematicians in the room, it's age times 30 plus 30, okay? So for a 10 year old, age times 30 plus 30, their bladder capacity should be 330 mils. So we can't keep using that equation because my bladder would fill this room. <laughs> we have to stop using it at the age of 12 because at the age of 12, it's an adult size bladder. And then the last thing is ensure that you're opening your bowels well. 
to ensure that there's no extra pressure ladder. The bedwetting alarms that we talk about is that if they're doing well with their drinking of their water during the day and they've got no daytime symptoms at all, they've got no urgency symptoms during the day, then one of the other things is that they're really deep sleepers. So it's trying to get them to wake up with any bit of leakage onto this pad that you can put um, on the bed. So a little bit of water or urine on that pad sets off an alarm that makes them wake up and then go for a wee. So we know that bedwetting um, alarms can also help with regards to it. There's a good website for children called ERIC, which is Enuresis Resource Information Center. And Enuresis is the, the technical word for bedwetting. And that's a good website to go to for further information. Sure. Thank you, Tari. So we have learned a lot about not only after 50, <laughs> but also for young children. Can you tell me about a typical case, like a, preferably over 50, because that is the topic for the day, um, that present, uh, presented with such difficulty and how it was managed? Yeah. So... I think I'm going to take uh, one of the um, something from the chat, if I may, um, and, and that is that question of, I think, urgency. So we get to see that quite often of that I need to go, I need to go right now. I rule out sort of what we call as red flag symptoms. So I make sure that there's no blood in the urine recurrent infections that's making me think of worrying things. And I guess by that, I mean cancers. I then talk about what fluids are they drinking? Are they just simply you know, drinking teas and coffees and no water? We know that caffeinated drinks, fizzy drinks, causes bladder spasms. Therefore, the first thing that I'd be advising them about is what fluids are they drinking? So cut out the teas and coffees. When I say that to a patient, they look them to stop their heroin addiction, you know? And it is a bit like a, 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 an addiction. Um, so I start a bit gently with them and say, switch from caffeinated drinks to decaffeinated drinks um, and, and trying to work on good old water and going to two liters for the girls or the women and, and three liters for the boys. And then training the bladder, doing the bladder diary so that you know where you are, that you're peeing every hour, and you're actually peeing, when you pee to that jug, you realize you're only peeing 100 mils each time. So trying to work your bladder up to a normal bladder capacity of 400 to 500 mils. Now, if you get that feeling of urgency, that, oh, I need to go, and that might be because your blood is starting to do a little squeeze, then what you want is your pelvic floor to do a good squeeze. So we talk about pelvic floor exercises. We might send them off to a pelvic physiotherapist to learn pelvic floor exercises so that we say eight squeezes three times a day so that when you get that feeling of, oh, I'm feeling urgent, then you just squeeze the pelvic floor, stop any leakage, except that the bladder spasm comes and it goes away. Therefore, you can then relax your pelvic floor again. Because if you keep tensing your pelvic floor, it's a bit like me, you know, showing my non-existent muscles to you all the time. If I do this pose all the time, and then you say, go pick up your heavy shopping, I won't be able to lift it because I fit muscles. So we want that wonderfulness with pelvic floor health of relaxing the pelvic floor most of the time but being able to engage it when you want to use it, which is that feeling of urgency or when you're just about to cough or sneeze. So it's those gentle measures of bladder training and pelvic floor exercises. We then send them away to see the pelvic physiotherapist and work on the bladder training um, for at least three months. And if that still doesn't work, then we talk about tablets. So the tablets that we would talk about stops those bladder spasms. 
And there's a whole variety of tablets, but good old tablets have side effects. So it's things like dry mouth, blurry vision, constipation. So we really want to know that you've given the bladder training, drinking the water, stopping your coffees and teas a really good go, because why would you want to take on the side effects of tablets if you can do something as simple as pelvic floor exercises and bladder training? I guess the issue is, you know, a few people come in saying, what about, you know, I just want that fix right now. I just, just fix me. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, it is very much a two-way engagement. I'm here to make you better, but you have to help in making yourself better. So really engaging with them to work on what's termed simple measures, but it is stopping an ad addiction of 70 years of stopping their teas and their coffees. And only if bladder training, pelvic floor exercises, the various tablets fail, then we start to talk about more invasive surgical procedures. So just as you can do Botox in the face, guess what? We can do Botox in the bladder. Um, so yeah, the reason why it looks so perfect, my face, <laughs> a little bit extra gets in the face. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so, so we, we were all about to ask you, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> it's good genetics. Um, so the Botox that we sometimes deliver into the bladder is to stop those bladder spasms. So just like Botox in the forehead wrinkles relaxes it and relaxes those muscles, the bladder muscle spasms stop and it works very well. But it can work so well, Botox, that when you want to squeeze, i.e. when you want to pee, you can't pee. So the side effect of Botox is not being able to pee. So patients then have to learn to pass a catheter themselves to embedder. So you can see how it has to be a stage by stage step of only if you, this is all quality of life things, incontinence is a quality of life issue. Only if you are bothered by your symptoms and if that first step in the training, the, the decaffeinated drinks is not working, the tablets is not working, then we start to talk about more invasive things because absolutely surgery works, operations and procedures work, but you have to be able to take on the risks of the procedure. So we try and, you know, we, we talk about informed consent. We tell our patients about what the risks are and only an individual can judge whether the risks, sort of the benefits outweigh the risks. And they will come in and they will say, I'm only using one pad a day but I'm very, very bothered by it. And I will take on those risks because to have- uh, Sorry, uh, Tani, I don't know why your voice keeps going and coming. So I can keep talking about Botox, but I guess that's invasive thing. Um, and I guess what I just want to reiterate is simple things do work. And, you know, to absolutely ensure that you do the simple things before you move on to the more intensive things sure okay thanks Ari. like i think you told us a lot about different things i think it's really important for us to learn which you know definitely in certain communities we are you know, really shy away from speaking about so thank you so much for that so you have told us many different things how it can be managed and as an expert in the field how can you tell us, of course, you know, um, having good uh, amount of water is one thing, but how can we maintain the good water works, I guess? Absolutely. And, and I know um, a lot of you do yoga and um, other exercises. You know, again, I, I would reiterate what I say to the children, actually. The drink we poo 
Um, but I'd add a few more bits to that, and that's drink your water, two liters or three liters, void regularly, but not too often. Ensure that your bowels are working well. Get your weight to the right level. Um, and that's really important. The other thing is, I guess, speaking to this audience specifically, is diabetes. So diabetes is such a prevalent issue. Uh, I feel I can't really speak on that, but there. Um, but I think diabetes and diabetic control is absolutely essential as well. Because if there's more sugar around, that's sugar in your urine, and therefore bacteria would love to grow in a pool of sugar rather than a pool of non-sugar. So ensuring that the diabetes with the HbA1c being a good measure of how good control is, it should be less than 42. And I know a lot of people will say, I've got borderline diabetes. And that statement also is slightly frustrating sometimes to, to a surgeon because we can only operate for elective procedures and so non-emergency if the diabetes is under good control because diabetes increases risks of operations like wound infections. So we, we want to reduce risk for operative, good operative outcome and diabetes plays an essential role for that. Diabetes and weight. And then the other big thing is smoking. So smoking, for all the cancers that I mentioned, apart from prostate, so bladder, huge risk with smoking, and kidney cancers. Both of them, smoking is a key risk to um, cause these cancers, and for bladder cancer, cause recurrences of that bladder cancer. So the biggest thing to do is stop smoking. Um, and we, we say this and reiterate this to our patients because it has such an impact on their health and well-being. Sure, thanks, Tani. So do you have a lot of patients who have managed these things pretty well? Absolutely, um, you know, when I was training, when I was appointed as a registrar, there was a feeling that we, they shouldn't be training so many surgeons because at, you know, 20 years ago, for every patient that comes into the urology outpatients department, out of three, one would be converted to a Now, or even 10 years ago, it became one in 10. So if there's 10 urology outpatients, only one gets converted to an operation. Why? Because we've got tablets, we can give good health advice and improve symptoms. So getting the sort of the messages right to try and get the patient to work on their own symptoms you can absolutely manage a lot of the patients that they don't have to go down uh, sort of operative, uh, down the operative route. Sometimes when I have medical students sitting in with me, they kind of question whether I'm a surgeon or not in the outpatients department, because so much of it feels like that I'm a psychiatrist, that I'm actually counseling them about something. So they walk out of there thinking, hold on, you know, what kind of clinic is this? But, um, you know, a, a good surgeon doesn't have to necessarily be, well, definitely has to be good with their hands, but also we need to know who to operate on and who not to operate on. It is, you know, it's, it's more about holistic approach, isn't it? It's yeah. not, and good few psychiatrists are on the platform. So I'm sure they are thrilled that you're <laughs> working with them. <laughs> Absolutely. And this. Thank you so much, Tardy. Honestly, we have, I have learned for sure a lot, and I'm sure other people have also learned so much because it's a very complex subject. 
people are reluctant to speak about, people are reluctant to get help. So hence, you know, we thought this was a great idea to ask an expert to come and, and I think you have really, really simplified it. And at the same time, you have made people understand it really well. So thank you so much for that. And it's been such a pleasure. So we will be coming back to you in a quite a, in a few minutes to ask the questions from the audience. I have already got a few um, lined up, uh, which has come to me. So, so following tradition, next Sunday, same time, same place, we will be having our episode 50. I couldn't believe that, you know, we have almost reached the episode 50 already, but here it is. We will be speaking about understanding menopause with Lakshmi Velayadar. She has also has a MVCHP, MRCOG, MD. So, and this, it will be next Sunday, same time, same place at two o'clock UK time, 6.30 India, Sri Lanka time. Lakshmi Velayadar is a consultant in obstetric and gynecology and Bats NHS Trust. She obtained a medical degree in the United Kingdom and undertook specialty training in London. She is the lead for obstetric and fetal medicine at Newham University Hospital. She has many more accolades, but we will come to that next week. So I can't wait for her to come and speak about another important topic we shy away from, uh, which is really real, which is there. Uh, so I think hopefully it's time to start addressing these things head on and start talking about it. Now over to Kanta Niranjan to give the word of thanks. Hi, Dani. On behalf of uh, Meet Menaka, I have a great privilege to give the vote of thanks to you. Congratulations for the very excellent talk today on a topic um, which people are reluctant to come forward, silent sufferers, and um, a problem not only for old age, it is from children, middle age, and it can affect anyone. And as a surgeon, I liked you, your talk in a way, what you mentioned, a good surgeon is, uh, knows when not to cut. And I think you are abiding by that. And I'm very happy to uh, bring you today in front of all the audience. Um, and I'd like to thank all the audience today for being here today. Uh, without you all, we cannot have a good um, uh, 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 platform. And uh, again, thank you very much. Um, and also I'd like to uh, thank uh, Tarni's parents again for giving uh, such a wonderful daughter, such a surgeon. Female surgeons are very rare and very difficult in top of all the commitments you have. You are still a mother of two kids and um, I'm really appreciative of it for your time today in midst of Wimbledon going on and everybody looking forward for football. Thank you very much, uh, Darni. See you again. See you soon sometime. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Kanta. It's so thank you so much for all the audience, as you said, between the Wimbledon and um, football. And I really appreciate uh, that you coming and supporting us. And thoroughly for between the sisters, they have covered the urology and the brain. So thank you so much. And um, yes, it, it, it was a great talk. First question to you, Tarani, from the audience is, how do you know if you have prostate cancer for men? Difficult one to know. The first thing that we start off with is a blood test called the PSA. Um, and if that is raised for, so we have age specific cutoffs for PSA. And if that is raised for, for that particular age group, it's round about three, four, five for sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, that sort of age cutoff. If it is then raised, you get sent to the urology department local to you on a two week rule cancer pathway. And that means to be seen by two weeks and to be treated by two months. So again, a nice pathway to ensure that you're treated in a timely way. When you're seen by a urologist, we then take a history, examine you and organize various tests. The first test that we do is an MRI scan. So it's a, going into a tunnel where we, um, it's about 30 minutes to go through that tunnel and we take pictures of the prostate. We then give the prostate a grade, if you like. 
And if it's a four or a five, then we say we are concerned that there's something significant going on in the prostate and we would then do prostate biopsies. If it's a one or a two, we are more reassured and we're happy to discharge. So I think it very much depends on what the symptoms are. If we're concerned about prostate cancer spread, and that means going into the bone, then we may do more tests like bone scans as well. Sure. Thanks, Saimi. Next question from the audience is, can you drink a large volume of water within a short period of time? Does it cause any damage to kidneys? So, um, yeah, th there was one patient who I said, drink your water, and he proceeded to <laughs> listen to what I said and drank 11 liters. Okay. Now that can cause dilution of chemicals in the blood, so low sodium. And low sodium or hypoatremia then can cause confusion, fitting, um, even unconsciousness. Now, so I guess I'd have to start off with, what do you mean by a large volume of water? If it is you know, a large volume is whatever, or my whole bottle and I drink my 700 mils, that's okay, that's going to be fine. But if you decide to drink 11 liters, um, or, or, you know, then, then you could be causing some trouble. If your kidneys are working well, you will just pee it out. So we say drink to thirst, but, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people drink to thirst and think, oh, I don't need to drink anything. I, I just can drink one glass of water. I'm all good. But that's not enough. For, so for the vast majority of people, it's two liters of water a day. The people who are told restrict their fluids may have kidney failure or renal impairment or other causes that make, make someone, so a doctor say you have to restrict your fluids a little. Um, and that's maybe to a liter of water a day. Sure, thank you so much. I think, you know, it's great your patients listen to you, <laughs> but I think you not know, the extreme, isn't it? That's, that's the message. Thank you, Tani. And for those of you who are going to the pub, if, if, you, know, if you want to, to watch the game, and, and you know, that drinking fast happens in the pub. So <laughs> down a pint, then a down another pint. And, and most of the boys, maybe girls as well, are able to handle that bladder stretching up quite quickly. And they're able to handle that. But I'm not going to be advocating push your bladder to a one liter bladder each time. Uh, and, and so, you know, I'd, I'd try to stay right in the middle, two to three liters of water a day, get your bladder to 400 to 500 mils for every void. Sure. I mean, there is something to tell about drowning the uh, pints and, uh, you know, <laughs> expanding the bladder for sure. And uh, it's a good point on a good day <laughs> before the games begin. Why do diabetes suffer a kidney damage? And is it the medication for diabetes which causes that? So um, I have to declare that I'm a urologist or a urological surgeon rather than a nephrologist. So a nephrologist is a doctor who looks after the kidneys and, a non, a, not, and not a surgeon. So I'm happy to take that question, but I'm not a specialist in that subject. The, what, you know, diabetes can cause kidney impairment and it's the poor diabetic control the poor sugar control that's causing it it's not the tablets so the simple answer is get the diabetes under good control um, what can it cause urologically if diabetes is poorly controlled it can have repercussions to sort of the peripheral nerves, the nerves going to the organs. So where, you know, if, uh, if you sort of do pinprick tests on the feet, they may not be able to feel that. And in a similar way, the nerve supply to the bladder can also be affected in poor diabetic control. So they too can get bladder complications 
because their diabetes is not being managed very well, they can get recurrent urinary tract infections because their diabetes is not being managed very well. So I guess the bottom line here is manage the diabetes. Sure. Thanks, Ali. The next question to you is, is there any precautionary measures to take um, steps to avoid prostate cancer? I think the simple answer is no. Um, but like everything, good general health. So making sure the weight is right, the diet is right. There was a trial about selenium and vitamin E, the select trial a few years ago, thinking, um, and lycopene, so tomatoes and various dietary factors. Um, and they did a trial on whether, you know, with patients taking more of it and, and patients not. And the bottom line was uh, selenium, lycopene, vitamin E did not reduce that risk of prostate cancer. So we've eat, so sometimes people talk about a high meat diet can also, does that also make people go towards getting prostate cancer? None of these have been proven. The, you know, if you look at what's the incidence of prostate cancer, 70% of 70 year olds would have prostate cancer. 80% of 80 year olds would have prostate cancer. 90% of 90 year olds would have prostate cancer. That means if you live long enough as a man, you would have prostate cancer. But the vast majority, they live, they die with it than from it. But we are trying to get a bit more nuanced and a bit more understanding about what is going to actually affect people's length of life. So keep a good health because if you need surgery, then we want you to be in the fittest place possible to have surgery. And the simple answer is no absolute dietary things that can reduce your risk of prostate cancer. Sure, thank you, Talmi. For people who are on the Zoom, please stay. We are going to take more questions. There are some questions which has come. Uh, so thank you so much. Just uh, bear with us. For people who are watching us on Facebook, it's that time of the day to say goodbye almost. So see you next week, hopefully, for Managing Menopause with Lakshmi Levelaidar at the same time, same place on next Sunday. Until then, stay safe, be happy and keep smiling.